video game music is something that evolved over the years into a real art form. Back when the Atari 2600 ruled the roost, many games didn't have music at all, or it was so simple you'd get a short tune here and there and not much more. Things really changed in 1985 when the NES graced us with its audio processing unit. Those five channels could belt out some seriously epic music, many of which are some of my favorites of the 8-bit generation. The NES was the first time I'd listened to game music outside of playing the actual game, a hobby that would grow in the coming years. When the Genesis launched in 1989, I was blown away by the music in its initial offerings. It didn't matter if we were talking about Altered Beast, Thunder Force 2, Mystic Defender, or Ghouls and Ghosts. I felt they all sounded great. But as the Genesis aged and we saw more Western software popping up, what I had been impressed by early on began to devolve into ear-shattering ballads that left me wondering just what the hell happened. In this episode, we're going to run down the games that sounded good and not so good on Sega's 16-bit wonder. Our ultimate goal is to answer that age-old question, did the sound of the Genesis hold it back or stifle it from even greater success? Get your ears ready for one heck of an episode, so let's get started. Without wasting much time on paper specs, let's do a quick summary on the Genesis sound hardware. Like many arcade boards of the time, the Genesis uses a Yamaha FM chip at the core of its audio capabilities. There could be six channels of just the FM synthesis, or there could be five channels of FM plus one PCM. The Yamaha chip is assisted by a programmable sound generator, which offers four channels of its own. The Genesis also lacked hardware-assisted compression for sound so things like digitized speech was often cut because it would take up either too much space or the quality was impacted in the developer's attempt to make it take up as little space as possible. To appreciate this episode, it is imperative that you understand what FM synthesis and PSG audio encapsulates from there. The key word in all of that is synthesis. To get audio on the Genesis, developers needed to create sound effects and compositions that were electronic recreations and approximations of their real-world counterparts. It didn't matter if it was the sound of a punch, the sound of lightning, or the sound of an instrument in a song. The advantage of this type of sound is the huge variety that can be achieved. Give two programmers the same song to mimic, and the results will almost certainly be wildly different from one another even if they are shooting to replicate the same instruments. FM Synth powered many of your favorite games in the arcade, and a number of home computers at the time, so it made sense for Sega to go all in with it. It made even more sense when you consider Sega's own arcade boards often used Yamaha sound chips, so it would make home conversions that much easier. And in those early years, the Genesis did a bang-up job right out the box. Sega's offerings of course sounded a little different, but it really was impressive how close things were. Third parties were also able to get some nice results from the Genesis in the first year. Falling back on their arcade and computer experience helped immensely. Mm -hmm. 
Sega's internal studios leverage their FM experience in exclusive games as well. Every so often, a generational talent would have a go at the FM synth of the Genesis, and absolute magic would ensue. Roughly that first year and a half of Genesis releases sounded good. It didn't matter the genre. It didn't matter whether it was an arcade port or something created just for the home market. The Genesis delivered a compelling audio experience. Even when the small number of Western developers weighed in with their efforts, it usually sounded quite nice. We close out 1990 with a fine example of what FM synthesis was capable of. Nineteen ninety one was the year everything began to change. Things started off very strong. That was the year a number of powerful, unforgettable soundtracks really defined the Genesis audio. Of course, you can't forget 1991 was the year Sonic showed up on the Genesis. The hardware saw an explosion in sales at this time and introduced millions of new customers to FM sound. Sega nailed most of that soundtrack too. It's easily one of my favorite parts of that game. Now you know me, you can't talk about sound on the Genesis without paying respect to 1991's Batman the Video Game. This is easily one of my favorite FM based soundtracks of all time. The important part of 1991 that you need to remember is the release of Sonic. It ignited a powder keg under the Genesis in North America and Europe. Sales shot through the roof and in an instant, there were a lot more Genesis owners across the world. Up until then, for roughly two years, the vast majority of the software released on the Genesis was steadily coming from Japan. There were a few Western developers and publishers like Electronic Arts and Tengen, but this was by far the exception when looking at the library in total. Now that Sega had so many more consoles in people's homes, they began to attract the attention of third parties that had not been a part of Sega's ecosystem before. Sega also needed more games than their Japanese arm could produce alone, so they began to turn to external Western developers for many of their games. As was typically the case back then, Genesis hardware documentation and tools were very poor or outright non-existent. So Sega of America knew from its own difficulties with FM Synth that it needed to provide some help to this new bunch of companies joining the fray. That's when GEMS, short for Genesis Editor for Music and Sound Effects, was created by a company called Recreational Brainware with help from Technopop. <laughs> 
This software allowed those with no experience with FM sound chips to get started and it would go on to be used in over 200 game releases. Many people assume GEMS is responsible for the bad reputation the Genesis received for sound, but there are a number of games that sounded terrible without it. As we begin 1992, Sega's internal Japanese studios and third parties are still doing their thing and providing Genesis software that typically looked and sounded great. Of course, there were actually a number of Western developed games in 1992 that didn't sound bad at all. I want you to remember that because here are some games that were done without gems where the sound team either had to figure out the Genesis on their own or they used another well-established sound driver like Chrysalis or SMPS 68000. These other sound drivers were definitely in the minority, however. Gems began to be used constantly by the contract Sega had outsourced in 1992. If Sega of America had anything to do with it, Gems would likely be powering the sound and music you heard. As you can already tell, the variance in gems here is pretty extreme already. Sometimes you'd get a nice melody that was easy on the ears and sometimes it would grate heavily. But it often wasn't the music that was the only problem, but the sound effects that went along with it. More and more Genesis titles were also using digitized speech, and it was becoming clear that this was a difficult task for many developers. Some games did it well, but many did not, giving the Genesis a reputation for scratchy voice work. Time and time again, gaming publications of the day would mention Genesis sound effects and speech as being a letdown, and it became burned into the minds of gamers everywhere. Music 
1992 ends with a slew of games that were a result of Sega's newfound success. A year had passed since Sonic, and now we had a sequel to that and a number of other big hit games. Genesis Sound was beginning to see a wide gulf in quality, but things were about to get a whole lot more interesting. If you have noticed so far, the games you've been listening to have been pretty much Genesis platform exclusives. That's because the first two years the Genesis was on the market, there was no Super Nintendo yet, so multi-platform titles were nearly non-existent. They began to trickle in during 1992, but it was 1993 when things really started to heat up between the two competitors. A few things happened in 1993 that changed the entire landscape of the Genesis. There was an explosion of multi-platform releases, the Genesis 2 redesign was a thing, and Japanese-based arcade ports began to dry up. The multi-platform thing brought about a renewed focus on Genesis sound, because now there were direct one-to-one -one comparisons with the Super Nintendo versions of these games. Since the Super Nintendo used a sound chip with sample-based instruments, it meant that many developers could easily produce a soundtrack that either mimicked the original compositions if it was a port, or it could belt out original tunes that sounded like something you would have heard using real instruments. The Super Nintendo also had eight channels, so many of its best sounded more complex. And that became the comparisons everyone made. A console that sounded like it used real instruments versus a console that used synthesis. Needless to say, this resulted in a wild array of opinions. Those that enjoy techno, electronica, synth pop, and various other music types that involve lots of synthesized instruments and sounds often enjoyed Genesis music quite a bit. But many others much preferred the sound the Super Nintendo produced because it sounded like the instruments you heard in the music and movies they preferred. It's a bit like taking something like Star Wars with its brilliant soundtrack and redoing the entire thing in FM synth. The difference would have some absolutely hating the change, while others would think it was incredible. Essentially, that is what was happening here. It was all about how synth and the samples met your ears. Fight! <laughs> This often left the Genesis in a bad light because many people felt the synth reproduction was incredibly weak in comparison. It didn't sound like real instruments, so it immediately was worse in comparison. The thing is, many games sounded fantastic to me, especially if it was an exclusive or the music wasn't trying to mimic something you had heard someplace else. There were releases in 1992 and 1993 that really blew my socks off. 
There is no question during this time many multi-platform games suffered in the sound department. Many will say it was gems at the heart of this matter, and it certainly had its fair share of contributors. There were gems-based soundtracks so poor, it had you wondering how the hell it passed any real quality control. It's easy to point to Gems as the culprit, but I feel Sega itself was guilty of not giving us the best the Genesis was capable of in its later years. The game Sega published should have been at the top of the heap, showing off FM synth in the best possible light. And yet many times it did not. The consensus in the media of the day was clearly the Super Nintendo was superior in the sound department. So Sega's first party games needed to be spectacular in this area. Time and time again, however, what we got was far from its best. Pig. Nineteen ninety three was full of hits, misses, and a whole lot of surprises on the Genesis. I'll leave you with some of my favorites that I never saw coming. As we begin 1994, the stream of multi-platform games turns into an absolute deluge. And if I'm being honest, this is where the majority of the bad reputation for Genesis Sound comes from. There were so many ports, lots of games easily compared in the same series, or licensed games with music so familiar that the FM synth of the Genesis was never going to replicate it with any satisfaction. <laughs> 
1994 was still an outstanding year for Genesis Audio when it came to exclusives, at least if you appreciated good FM synth. I really can't stress enough the difference this makes. The strength of the Genesis sound chip was almost entirely its ability to sound so incredibly different based on the composer that was working with it. If that composer was skilled, I don't think it mattered what sound driver was used. It could be something created just for that game, or it could even be the dreaded gems. Composer's skill and your level of enjoyment for synth-based music is what mattered. Nothing the Genesis was gonna do, no matter how well done, was ever gonna impress you if you always preferred the sound of sample-based instruments. The Super Nintendo often sounded like it had a mini orchestra inside it playing its music, and I believe to the vast majority of people, that was simply more desirable than synth-based recreations. Games like Streets of Rage really hammer this point home. Let this soundtrack loose on people that enjoy techno and trance, and they'll come away telling you it's a masterpiece. Give it to a Super Nintendo kid, and they're likely to tell you it's complete garbage. It wasn't just a divide in expectation, it was a chasm between the preference of sound itself. Let's have some extremes to see exactly what I mean. I suppose my conclusion here is that yes, I believe the sound of the Genesis did hurt the machine in the eyes of the average consumer when compared to its direct competitor, the Super Nintendo. I am of the opinion that the majority of people took to the samples over the synth. They wanted music that sounded like the stuff they heard in the vast majority of the movies and albums they listened to outside of gaming. But here's the rub, when Genesis sound was done great, and that FM chip was belting out one of its classic tunes, it could really be something special. It was an important part of the Sega experience. The huge variance in how a game could sound on the Genesis was almost a quagmire. On one hand, it could mean you got lots of games that sounded very different from one another, but you also got a pretty large difference in the quality of those games. Mix in a healthy amount of Western developers who simply did not have the experience with FM synth to take the best advantage of it, and sometimes the Genesis truly did come away sounding a lot weaker than its 16-bit competitors. I know this may be difficult to hear for Sega fans that loved FM and would never consider it a weakness, but just consider the average gamer is not a hardcore fan of electronic music. Let's have a listen to some final examples. <laughs> <laughs> 
Doing this episode was tough for me because I am of the opinion that Genesis did some of the best music of the 16-bit generation. I would have no trouble rattling off dozens of games that I think sound fantastic, and dozens more that I feel give the best of the Super Nintendo a run for its money. But when coming up against a question like this, you really do have to consider the majority. And the simple truth is, I believe most gamers preferred the sound of the Super Nintendo. The chip inside Nintendo's 16-bit entry was a Sony-developed miracle in all reality. It was 1990 hardware that could produce near theatrical quality music. That's no small thing, and something not easily overlooked when comparing the two competitors. Another area I didn't touch upon in this episode were the differences between the actual revisions of the Genesis and Mega Drive motherboards over the course of its life. Sega was always tinkering and changing things, so the quality of the sound can vary greatly between these revisions. How a Model 1 launch Genesis sounds against a Model 2 Genesis can be quite startling. There are some revisions out there so bad, it sounds like a different chipset altogether. Do your homework if you want the best the hardware can offer. I can tell you that as someone that owned both the Genesis and the Super Nintendo back then, I really appreciated their differences. Getting serenaded by a powerful orchestra while battling monsters in Actraiser was priceless. But so was hard-hitting club music that pumped away while I was beating down bad guys in Streets of Rage. It wasn't just about how good these games sounded, but also about how different they sounded from one another. When both consoles were at their best, they produced sound that really stood out from one another. That's part of what made the 16-bit era so special to me. Not only were these two consoles putting out excellent games consistently, but they were also putting out games that looked and sounded very different from each other. Variety is the spice that keeps life interesting, and this era of gaming was truly special because of it. I'm Sigalord X. Thank you guys for listening, and I will catch you next time.